In this video, we look at protecting digital systems and data from threats. There are many methods and techniques that we can use to help protect digital systems and data from threats. The ones listed on the screen now are mentioned in your syllabus, so we're going to go over each of them. The first we discussed is access levels. So computer systems, especially in large organisations, hold vast amounts of data. It would not be appropriate for everyone working for the organisation to have access to all data at all times. In fact, data protection and privacy laws would make it illegal if staff had unrestricted access to data, especially data related to individuals. Restricting users' access to data by using access levels makes sure that sensitive data is protected, only data that people need to do their jobs is accessible, and therefore it minimises the potential for misuse of sensitive or private data. The golden rule really is only give people access to the systems and data they need in order to carry out their job effectively. Teachers likewise may only be able to access information on their home drives. The exams officer has no real need to access the students or teachers home drives but does need to access all the exam data. The finance officer doesn't need to have access to any of the previous information, but does need to access all the financial data and probably details about employees in terms of how much they're paid and overtime. Here we have a senior leader or head teacher who arguably has a much broader access, allowing them to access data from across the organisation. And here we have a network administrator who has access to everything, including all the file backups. Anti-malware software helps keep your computer and files safe from many types of malware, including viruses, trojan, worms and spyware. Virtually all operating systems come with malware protection built in, configured and turned on by default. And as with many other forms of utility software, there's also plenty of companies who specialise in dedicated anti-malware programmes. Anti-malware programmes are one of the main ways of protecting digital systems and data. Authentication. So there are three different methods of authentication we need to look at. The first and simplest is username and passwords. Using username and passwords are a very common method of preventing unauthorised access to a computer system. Users must enter their username followed by their password to gain access to the system. A password system can be made more secure by implementing various password rules. It should be noted though that simply adding loads of complexity to password rules is not necessarily the best way to help increase security. If password rules are too overly complex, especially getting people to change passwords too frequently, research has shown that all people do is end up writing down the passwords, thus negating the security aspect. Another form of authentication becoming increasingly popular is the use of biometrics. This is the technical term for body measurements and calculations, and it refers to metrics related to human characteristics. Biometric authentication is often used in technology as a form of identification and access control. Biometric measures include fingerprint scanning, retinal scanning and voice pattern recognition. These sorts of patterns are very unique, so they're a great way to authenticate a user's identity. They're commonly used by smartphone owners, allowing them to gain access to their device without having to remember a passcode. The final authentication method we'll talk about is two-step verification. Entering a username and password to log on to a system can be made further secured by two-step verification also known as two-factor authentication. This involves using two separate authentication methods performed one after the other. An example could be logging in as normal to a system using your username and password, followed by entering a code sent separately to your email or your phone. 
Next, we're going to discuss automatic software updates. Popular software often becomes the target of large scale malware attacks. Most modern software uses automatic updates to apply patches and bug fixes when security vulnerabilities are discovered. Enabling automatic software updates ensures a product is kept up to date and security flaws are fixed as soon as possible without the need for manual intervention. Updates are especially important with operating systems and antivirus software. Checking the spelling and tone of communications. So when emails are received, especially unexpected emails or those containing instructions to click a link or download an attachment, it's very important to be careful. You should carefully check the spelling and grammar of the email and any links. Genuine professional companies do not send out emails containing spelling or serious grammatical errors. Carefully check the tone in the email. If the email seems to be rushing you to take some immediate action or supply sensitive information such as logging credentials or confirming payment details, it could be a phishing scam. Checking the URL attached to a link. It's also very important to check any URLs you are sent to, especially those which are embedded into images. Scammers often create fake look-alike websites with very similar URLs to legitimate websites. A web address that closely matches a genuine one with the intent of fooling is known as typo squatting. Many browsers now display friendly versions of URLs. Here we see a friendly version of Amazon's URL, amazon.com. You can always double click in the URL address bar to see the complete URL. Is it spelt correctly? Does it start with the HTTPS protocol or just HTTP? HTTPS, don't forget, means the website's using a secure connection with a valid security certificate. Look out for the padlock symbol in the URL address bar, which also shows this. Learn to be suspicious of links hidden behind text, such as click here or attach to image buttons. You can easily check the real destination by hovering over the link or right clicking the link and choosing copy link address or similar. We can see here that when checking the URL attached to this button, it's clearly going to a very bizarre URL. This is clearly not the official Amazon URL. The company's not mentioned anywhere. The URL starts with HTTP. This is more than likely a scam. Next, we look at firewalls. A firewall is a piece of software or hardware, sometimes both, configured to only let certain traffic through it. It can be set up to prevent unwanted traffic from getting access to a LAN and from users connected to a LAN from accessing part of the internet so that the owner doesn't want them to. It can block certain ports and types of traffic and inspect data traveling across it to see if it looks suspicious. Operating systems and home routers come with built-in firewalls, but again, you can buy more sophisticated ones from dedicated providers. Next, we look at privacy settings. Many web browsers, social networking apps and other websites allow you to configure a variety of privacy settings. These are designed to limit who can see and access your content. Privacy can refer to do not track settings, so preventing websites from collecting personal browser data. Private browsing, so that's preventing a web browser from tracking and storing browsing history or storing cookies. Location tracking, preventing apps for getting access to or showing a location on a phone GPS data. And view settings, deciding what types of information and data you share with others via social media can include different settings for yourself, friends and others. A proxy server is a separate intermediate device between a user and a remote web server which traffic must pass through. There are various advantages to using a proxy server. It can allow traffic to be easily filtered or blocked. 
it can keep users' IP addresses secret, thus further improving security. And they can be used to cache frequently accessed websites and data, thus speeding up access. And of course, these proxy servers often can and do act as hardware firewalls. Finally, we look at Secure Socket Layer or SSL security protocol. SSL provides a secure communication channel between two devices operating on either a local network or over the internet. It can be used in a number of situations and is commonly used for communication between a web browser and a web server. In this situation, the URL will use the HTTPS address for the website with the S standing for secure. That's everything you need to know for this video. Pause now and take some notes. Thank you.